be okay with the fact that things change, but get the best that you can out there when you start. If you throw it out there first and think I can come back and later and fix it, you don't have time to come back later and fix it. This is The Entrepreneur Way with Neil Ball. Unlocking the secrets of successful entrepreneurs seven days a week. Subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Twitter at Neil D. Ball. Napoleon Hill said the power of the mastermind is the driving force. To discover how you can unlock the potential in your business using the power of a mastermind, go to mastermindunlimited.com. And now, here is your host, Neil Ball. Hello, it's Neil Ball here. Thank you so much for joining me today on The Entrepreneur Way. The Entrepreneur Way is about the entrepreneur's journey, the vision, the mindset, the commitment, the sacrifice, failures and successes. I am so excited to bring you our special guest today, Lisa Malice. But before I introduce you to Lisa, I have a quote for you by Martin Luther King Jr. Here is the true meaning and value of compassion and nonviolence. When it helps us to see the enemy's point of view, to hear his questions, to know his assessment of ourselves. For from his view, we may indeed see the basic weaknesses of our own condition. And if we are mature, we may learn and grow and profit from the wisdom of the brothers who are called the opposition. The entrepreneur way asks the questions so we all get the insight, inspiration and ideas to apply in our businesses. Lisa, welcome to the show. Are you ready to share your version of the entrepreneur way with us? Yes, I am. Thank you very much for coming on the show today, Lisa. Thank you so much for having me. You are welcome. Lisa Malice works with people who are constantly dealing with a packed schedule and who want to increase their business success without working nights and weekends. She lives in Chagring Falls, Ohio, with her husband, Lou. She loves chocolate, the beach, and country music. Lisa, can you provide us with some more insight into your business and personal life to allow us to get to know more about who you are and what you do? Absolutely. I'm happy to. So I am a coach who works with business owners who are experiencing a change or a growth in their business and then also with their employees. So when I say a change or a growth in their business, what I'm talking about is the growth part's easy to understand. <laughs> it means that they've added a new service line or they're, um, they've re just gotten recently um, a new client. And so business has doubled and the way that it worked before doesn't work for them anymore. Their systems aren't enough to handle it um, or they've had a change. So sometimes it could be that there's um, everything was working smoothly and they just became the a board member for an organization or everything was working smoothly and they started, they now care for an elderly parent um, or they went through some employee turnover. And so the biggest part of what I work with with business owners is the fact that they're in a place where they felt like they used to have it all together. And then all of a sudden they start having those days and you can, you know, call it an oh bleep day <laughs> where you're like, I can't believe I just did that. Some of my clients call them, I can't believe I just did that days. Mm -hmm. um, and they're like, I, I used to have this under control. What's going on now? And so then together, we're able to work through that and help figure out where's the glitch in their systems? What's happened? Um, typically, it's from a productivity and efficiency standpoint. Maybe they just need um, to be able to delegate more effectively. Um, maybe because they used to be able to keep things in their head all the time, they now are not able to do that because there's more stuff to keep in their head. Mm -hmm. So we just go in, tweak some things, fix some things, and then they're able to move forward 
in a much more um, in control, less stress, <laughs> happier, efficient way. And then I do that same uh, skill set training with employees of businesses also. Um, because many times we find that employees don't perform up to their level of um up to the level of their skill set because of the fact that all the stuff is getting in the way all, all day. So if they find that they're spending six hours a day in email, they're not the best engineer they can be mm-hmm. because they're log, bogged down and all that other stuff. So that's the business side. On the personal side, I have a husband and uh, he has a dog that is here. Um, I work at the home office, so the dog is here in Cleveland, Ohio um, right now. I have gave her many treats and bones and toys, hoping she will be quiet through the interview. And then um, uh, he, I also have um, three stepdaughters and two grandkids now. Wow. So you're in the business of taking people from fire fighting to fire prevention almost in their businesses. Yes, and that is one of the phrases that I use when I'm working with people. I will say, is this your fire? Mm -hmm. And so first it's, is this your fire? Is it yours or is it someone else that you work with? And secondly, is it actually a real fire? Mm -hmm. And typically fires are huge loss of income or safety. All that other stuff is just unexpected. Yeah. So, I mean, just listening to what you're saying, it sounds to me like people... Some of the people you work with, it might be that they have just a freak day of some kind and a pile of things just happen. And that really sort of, ex- that really brings to the surface a lot of the weaknesses in their systems that are there in any case. And they sort of deal with on a daily basis, but all of a sudden they, they just get to a, a critical mass on a certain day and it just becomes too much almost. Yes, I uh, exactly. One of my uh, clients her and I were at a event together and um, it was, it happened to be buy your own lunch and we get to the end and she looks at me and she, she's got her briefcase with her. She has a purse with her. She has everything. She looks at me and she goes, I forgot my wallet. Mm-hmm. She's like, I can't pay for my lunch. Can I please hire you today? And I was like, Oh my gosh, this is the best lunch ever. <laughs> well <laughs> worth the $12 salad. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> But it's that it's all of a sudden that day gets more uh, happens more often and it gets embarrassing because all of my clients are good at what they do. They are great business owners. They are successful. And all of a sudden, like you said, the cracks start to show and they they know they need to change that. And what is the what's the, uh, the process that you go through once you once they start they engage you and you start to work with them? Can you just give us a brief outline of the type of thing you do to to try and remedy some of those things? Yeah, absolutely. So, with all my clients, we start with just a conversation about what's going on and to make sure that we're a good fit before we engage in a coaching session. And then once we get in and start working, we start to look at what are the priorities and what's most important. And what then are they actually doing with their days? And so a big part of my job is to say to my client, you said to me that exercise was really important to you, that it's important to you to take care of your health. However, you just told me that you worked X number of 60 hour days and haven't been to the gym in three weeks. And so it's my job to try to mirror back to them. You know, you told me these were your priorities, yet this is what's happening. And so that's usually our first step of just getting clear about what are really the priorities and how are they spending their time? There's 168 hours in the week. They don't get to plan for 240 of them. Like they actually have to live in 168 like the rest of us. Um, Then from there, we start to address, I have a couple different assessments that we use so that we can go, it's a lot easier, I think sometimes to go off of data instead of off emotion, because it isn't that there's something wrong with them. It's just there's a skill set that needs shored up. And using assessments helps that. It takes off the I'm a failure type of a thing. And then from there, we just address, you know, what is it? Is it delegating? Is it task tracking? Is it visioning? Um, Whatever it may be. And then we just work through that process um, until we start to feel confident that they can move forward. What do you enjoy most about what you do? 
I love the fact that on a business side, that every day is different. Um, I came from a career in high school education. And as a teacher, I knew that the content was going to be different every day, that the kids were going to be different every day. Um, and I love that. I love that I have the flexibility. My husband is still in education. And so I flex my hours in the summer so that I spend more time with him when he's home. And I love that I have the ability to do that because I've built a business that allows me that flexibility. And how did you, how did you get into the business that you're in now, Lisa? What's the story behind that? I, um, I, I am a um, true example of the phrase, just because you're good at something doesn't mean that that's what you should do for the rest of your life. <laughs> so I, it was very strong in math. I got my degree in math. I left college, had no idea what to do with it. So I became a teacher. Like those decisions were all like, well, okay, I guess I'll do this. Okay, I guess I'll do that. And so I'm in education and realize I don't want to spend 30 years in education, even though I'm very good in the classroom. And so I said, well, I'll become an administrator. So then I became an athletic director in charge of all of our coaches and athletes. And I realized that even though I'm really good at that, I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. Um, I want to have more control over um, what I do, what those results look like. And so um, also along that path, I recognize that left to my own devices, I will work from the moment I get up until I fall asleep exhausted at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And that's not healthy. And so I hit a health crisis and recognized that I either needed to say this was my new life. I was just always going to be tired and sick or I needed to change something. And it's hard to change who you are at your core because I'm a worker. That's who I am. Um, and so I started to build some structures for myself and figuring out how can I work and live to a place where I can be healthy and focus on me because there's more to life than work. And so at that point, I was like, okay, you're hitting crunch time now. What is it you're going to do with the rest of your life? <laughs> because it wasn't going to be education. I knew that I didn't have the passion for it and I didn't, um, especially in administration, I couldn't um, force myself to go home unless all the work was done. And so then at that point, I was fortunate enough that I had a number of people in my life who reached out and asked me to help them in things that were all very similar. And I started to recognize, hey, this skill set of being able to see order through chaos, that's not something everyone can do. That's a marketable skill set. And then I decided to go back to school, become a certified coach, and then open my business from there. So what drives you to do what you do? It is absolutely positively that light bulb moment that I see with clients. Mm -hmm. um, part of that was what I was getting from education, like being able to explain it and see the kid go, oh, I got it. I mean, but to be able to do that on a, a different scale with my clients and to see them start to see their potential in the way that I can see it. Um, cause we all have our, we all carry around our stuff and often people outside of us can see the greatness and the brilliance that are within us that we can't see ourselves. And so it's when I start to see my clients recognize that, um, one of my clients owns a yoga studio and she, um, at one of our sessions, she said, you understand that my husband and I have owned this for, you know, I don't know, eight years. And this is the first time I felt I've been a true partner with him in the business. I just thought all I was was someone who taught yoga, but I'm actually a business owner and I can do this. That's the stuff that drives me. How do you relax when you're not working in your business? I am a huge Cleveland Indians fan. Um, and so for those of you who are not in the United States, <laughs> um, it's a baseball team <laughs> and I love them. I love them when they weren't winning and I love them now that they are. And so hopefully um, once this episode um, airs, they will have won the World Series. We can only hope and knock on wood. Um, so that's one of the ways. So from like March-ish through, if we're lucky, early November, that is absolutely how I relax. I watch their games and read up on their interviews and everything I can. Um, the other time, I like to read. I'm an introvert. 
a very, very high introvert. So I regain my energy from being alone. So I like to read. Um, I like to veg on the couch and just watch old Law and Order episodes. Um, and we just recently, my husband and I recently bought kayaks. And so while the weather has been decent, we've been out do, doing some kayaking. But as long as I can just be by myself, <laughs> usually when I need to relax, I'm good. Mm -hmm. Do you have any entrepreneurial role models? I do. I have two. And they're both coaches I'm currently working with. One of them is uh, more of a personal development coach. She actually is I'm in the process of getting my coaching certificate um, recertified. And so she's my mentor coach through that. And so I really admire her because no matter what's going on around her, she has that ability to look like everything is is easy and she's calm and serene. And that's one of those traits that I try to instill in my clients. And it's one that I'm always working to better in myself. And so she definitely is, that is one of them. And then my other role model is one of the coaches that I work with um, on a marketing perspective. And she has built the business that I want to build. I mean, so one of the great things when we work together, she's always like, Lisa, I'm just a couple years ahead of you. You're right where I was a couple years ago and, and things are gonna be great. And so she is, so it's, I can see exactly what I want living right there in front of me. So do you, who are the, what are the names of these people? So my personal development coach right now is Lori Gorell, and she is here in Ohio also. And then my marketing coach is Mary Kravitz, who is out in California. Um, and are both are wonderful, wonderful women. We've had Mary on the show. Yes, I, that was how we got connected. Mm -hmm. Lisa, what I'd like to do now is talk about the time before you were an entrepreneur. What difficulties did you have to overcome when you started your business? Well, I started it because I recognized that I had a skill set that was viable. Mm -hmm. I did not have any business experience. <laughs> I had no, like, I just thought I decided I was a coach. And I decided I was a coach before I took a coaching class. Um, so there was a huge, I didn't know what I didn't know type of a deal. Um, and so when we talk about difficulties, I think it was just my own lack of knowledge was the biggest difficulty when I started. How did being a coach differ for you from being a teacher for kids at school? Well, when you're a teacher, you just tell them what to do mm. and they listen. <laughs> um, <laughs> you, hope. you know, you hope, exactly, you hope. Um, and, you know, you go through a couple examples with them and then you're like, oh, okay, I think they've got it. Um, you know, and it's more involved than that. I'm definitely not downplaying the, the um, profession. I spent many years in it. Um, but the biggest difference is in coaching, you don't tell them what to do. <laughs> you, you know, explore ideas and, and you know, the closest I'll come to saying, look, go do this, is let's brainstorm some potential solutions mm -hmm. because they have the answers. All of my clients have the answers right there inside of them. They just can't always see it because it's them. They're, they can't see the forest for the trees. They're in the middle of the weeds and they can't get out. And I can just add that clarity for them. So there's a lot less telling and a lot more asking between teaching and coaching for me. So do you think if you went back to be a teacher, you'd be a different type of, your teaching would be different now, given that oh, you've now been a coach? Yes, absolutely. Um, absolutely. And when I work with, periodically I'll work with students. Um, and that's one of the big things. It's like, what are you, you know, a lot of, what do you want to gain from this? What do we want to talk about? What, how do you, a lot more of those questioning. And if I were in the classroom, it would be the same thing. The challenges in the classroom, you have 30 brains in there. Where when I'm doing one-on-one -on -one coaching with clients, I just have one. Did you have any doubts that delayed you starting your business? I was stuck on, for a while, I was stuck on what happens if I don't, what happens if I quit my job and don't make any money? <laughs> like that was definitely one of those. And so then it was like, well, let's get all your ducks in a row. 
type of a deal. And I remember sitting eating lunch. Um, I was still at the school. I was sitting eating lunch with um, someone who worked with me who was, I don't know, probably 10, 15 years younger than I am. And she was like, um, I'm going to do this and then we're getting married and I'm going to have kids and I'm going to work for my father's company. And I'm going to, and she it was like laying it all out. And I remember sitting there thinking, I have let my doubts slow me down for three years. For three years, I've been trying to get my ducks in a row. And I don't even know what those ducks are, but I've been trying to get them all in a row. And here she is going, yeah, at the end of this year, I'm working the summer for my dad so that when I get married and we have kids, I have a second, you know, it's like, she was like, boom, boom, boom. And I'm like, I've been treading water for three years and I'm not all that much closer to getting ready to go. And so at that point it was like, okay, the clients will come or I'll just go get another job or whatever, but it's time to go, let's move, let's start the business. What mistakes did you make that slowed your journey? I thought that when I built a website, the clients would magically come. <laughs> it turns out that's not true. <laughs> like, I really thought you put it up there and it's, you know, boom, there they'll be. Um, and so at, then it was like, oh, wait a minute. I I threw up a website without even knowing what who's my target audience. What are the services I'm actually providing? Like you would look at it and it, things were all over the place. And so then at that point, I had to redo everything. And I know as an entrepreneur, things change and you have to redo things along the way. Um, but because I didn't have a clear enough picture of where I was, like the first couple of years were hard. <laughs> they were really hard. What are some of the things that you did before you started your business that would be helpful tips to some of the listeners who haven't yet taken the first step on the entrepreneur way? So one of the things that I did was I actually transitioned um, from my current job to my new business by taking some of the work that I was doing for them at the time and um, contracting that through my company. So at least I had a client when I first started, um, even though I was doing very similar work, it was I was just being paid differently. And so I, for a mindset piece, that was big for me. And then um, I also, once I, like, I didn't know what I didn't know, but I started to ask and I started to get some advice from people. Um, and I think the other part to that question is just that I didn't know then, but for people who are listening now is be okay with the fact that things change, but get the best that you can out there when you start. If you throw it out there first and think I can come back and later and fix it, you don't have time to come back later and fix it. Lisa, what I'd like to do now is just talk about the entrepreneurial journey a little bit more with you. Do you think culture is important from the beginning in a business? I do. Uh, a lot of my uh, work in education came in um, through uh, Catholic schools. And so I definitely have that um, servant leadership uh, background. And so I think when I think of culture in my business, I think about, okay, how would I want people to treat me? And then how do I want and then let's behave that way. And how do I want everyone that I can't come into contact to feel? You know, it's important that all of my clients think that they're my only client. And they're not, but it's important to me that they feel that way. It's important that um, that I, that no one ever feels like I'm phoning it in or um, or anything along those lines. It's that that is the culture that I have here and that my virtual assistant who works for me and some of the other coaches that I work with, um, that's that piece of uh, definitely, I think the way to pull this into a tighter answer for you is that it's that servant leadership. How do you make sure that you work with the right people so that they fit with the culture in your business? It's definitely more of a gut feel for me. Um, and I am not particularly uh, intuitive or I don't view myself as. However, when I work, when I think, is this someone that I want working with my clients? It's like, well, do they get along? Do I get along with them well? Do I have a good, solid feeling when I'm with them? 
you know, one of the great things with my clients, whether I'm working one-on-one coaching or I'm going in and doing training, is that whomever is my contact person for the training or the client themselves, that we get each other. Like you, you laugh at my jokes. I laugh at yours and I'm not doing it to be polite. Like I really think you're funny and they think I'm funny and I'm not necessarily all that funny. So just a small, small pool of people out there. Um, But like we get each other and that's important to me. And so if I don't get that same feel when I'm working with another coach or with my assistant or anything like that, I, I just don't bring them on board. Knowing what you know now, is there anything that if you'd known it when you started out that would have helped you to shortcut the learning curve? I think there's two things. Um, One is when you recognize the fact that you're in the place of, I don't know what I don't know, reach out and find someone who does. (laughs) Like, for goodness sakes, get out there Um, and find someone who's like, hey, I'm a business coach and I can tell you, here are the 10 steps you need to do to start your business. Um, So that is definitely a piece of the other side, though, for me, being an introvert and being in a relationship business, like networking is really important. And I really um, wish I would have hired someone early to help me figure out how to network effectively, um, because I, I would go to networking events. I'd get their look around the room, not see anybody that I knew, and I'd go hide out in the bathroom until it was time for the speaker. And then as soon as the presentation portion was over, I'd look around. No one was making eye contact. So I'd grab my stuff and go. And then I think, well, this networking, it doesn't work Mm -hmm. because I wasn't engaging anywhere. Um, And it took a while to start to feel comfortable in a room of strangers. And how, how do you do? How do you show up at those types of events now? What's different about what you do? I got involved. Mm -hmm. um, And almost, well, all the organizations that I go to now, or let me back up. I'm not saying it's easy for anyone who's sitting out there this, it's saying, oh my gosh, Lisa, I do that too. <laughs> um, I'm not going to tell you it was easy and I snapped my fingers and it worked. Um, but I definitely got involved. I'm on the board um, of to the organizations that I am most involved with. And that gave me a job to do at the meeting. So I had a purpose. And then, then I was more comfortable because I didn't have to feel like I needed to create um, small talk up front before I started to know people. Because I like, what do you? Only so many times you can say, "How's the weather?" You know, we all live here; we know how the weather is. Um, so, you know, so that was the thing. Get involved was the biggest thing that I did. And then I went to workshops. You know, I worked with Lori on, you know, power pose, which is an Amy Cuddy um, TED talk about how to how to stand and how to present yourself so that you feel more confident. Um, and it just and it's still hard. Like I will still pull in and think, oh. Who am I going to talk to? And then I think, let it go. There'll be people in there that you know, know, no one. Talk to them first and you'll start to feel comfortable. How much does gut feeling influence your decisions in your business? So part of it is, um, I think the place where gut comes in the most is is the people portion. So like part of it was, you know, what coaches do I want to work with and, and pieces like that. But it's also on clients. When I'm speaking with a client, do I have that feeling like, yeah, this is going to go the way I want? Or do I get those red flags that I think, oh, I'll just ignore those because there's all these other check, you know, all these other um, boxes are checked. But there's that one red flag. And every time I've every time I've ignored the red flag because all the boxes are checked, I've come to regret it. So what makes you uncomfortable as an entrepreneur? Um, on a coaching side, it's the uh, it's talking with a potential client and getting the feeling of that um, I'm going to be their answer and fix them. Uh, because I can only help show the path, but the work happens on their side. So like that's a piece that makes me uncomfortable from the coaching standpoint. Also from the coaching standpoint is um, a client who... Uh, falls into a potential client, not a client, a potential client who falls into that victim mentality place. Um, that's just not a strength in my coaching skill set to work through that victim mentality. So I know that's an area that needs to refer out. Um, the other thing as an entrepreneur that makes me feel uncomfortable is working 
with um, someone as a service provider who doesn't tend to line up straight on with my values. So sometimes that'll happen if I go to a workshop and they'll be offering a couple, you know, here's a couple more sessions for whatever. And then we start to dig in. I'm like, ooh, wait a minute. They're one of those marketers who believes in emailing your list 12 times a day with, you know, flashing letters and, you know, buy now and, you know, like those screaming emails. And I'm like, ooh, that's not me. Mm -hmm. um, so then there's like that mismatch on how we feel uh, and how we work together as um, to present what what our vision is. And so that makes me uncomfortable. And what do you think are some of the secrets to success? I think the secret to success or one of them is knowing that you aren't going to go it alone. One of my favorite phrases is I'm not, uh, it takes a village to raise me. And I'm glad so many people do their part. You know, at any time I'm working with at least two different coaches, um, co I believe coaches need coaches too. But then I also have, you know, a, a support staff here. Um, my family is very engaged. Uh, knowing that, you know, the boards that I sit on or the organizations I'm with, knowing that I could reach out to any of them um, to bounce ideas off of. You know, one of the things about being a solopreneur or small business owner or entrepreneur that is in a more isolated field, sometimes the only person you have to bounce things off of is yourself. And that does not get to be a great conversation. Um, and so knowing that um, one of those keys to success is knowing that you have people out there who can um, and will help you as you work through your journey. Life is made of constant change, whether we like it or not. And many people say that the only constant in life is change. Lisa, how do you try to keep up with change? One of the ways is to make sure that I'm involved in professional organizations. So I'm a member of NABO, which is the National Association of Women Business Owners. And they do a great job of sending us e-blasts and information on, you know, what's changing in employment law and what's changing in small business tax and those types of things. Um, also, the International Coach Federation is another organization I belong to, and they also send us um, a lot of information about what's changing in the coaching industry. What are some of the new um, styles and new strategies and new things that you can learn? And so one of those things that I know that I'm getting a great influx of information from the business owner standpoint and then also from the skill set standpoint. And I just make sure that I s dedicate the time to read. What is your favorite book on entrepreneurialism, business, personal development, leadership or motivation? And can you tell us why you have chosen it? Absolutely. And I have I have more than one favorite. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to share three of them with okay. you. Um, one of them is Profit First. Yeah. I, and I really, really enjoyed that book because it gave me the structure to help me think about the finances of the business. It, it gave me some rules, um, you know, and I have a great accountant. Don't get me wrong. Um, but I. I, I would just kind of go in and be like, okay, are we on track for quarterly taxes? Okay, great. And then I started to be like, oh man, I can't believe I have to pay my taxes. Where Profit First is like, no, every month put 15% aside for your taxes. So when it's time to pay for them, it's no longer like, oh, I can't believe to pay for my taxes. It's like, woohoo, look at me. I've got enough money set aside that I can make my quarterly tax bill. This is great. Um, So that was definitely one of them because it helped me from a a structural framework perspective. And then um, the Productivity Project with Chris Bailey, that book, or not that book, I get the, the man who wrote that book and the book changed the way that I coach my clients. I had um, for a number of years been, was very, very heavy on um, your, one of the solutions to your problem is time management. And I, I lived in that space and I kept feeling like there was pieces missing. And in his book, he talks about how it's not just time management. There's also, you know, how do you bring in your focus and how do you keep your energy at a good level? 
And so then I was like, those are my missing pieces. You can only get so far if you only focus on time. There's those other pieces too. And then once I, and I know he's not the first person ever to say that. However, the way he wrote it clicked with me. And I was like, okay, now I can adapt the way that I work with my clients and bring in these other two strong pieces. And then the third one is the myth of multitasking uh, by Dave Crenshaw. And that book gave me the best exercise that I use in live presentations and that I use with the start of working with my clients that immediately help them break the habit of multitasking. Um, And he does a great job in that book of explaining the difference of what multitasking is and background tasking and switch tasking and the difference between those things. Um, But it is by far one of the things when you want to be in front of an audience and have them buy into what you're sharing quickly, pulling that exercise from his book does that for me every time. Folks, when you have a busy life, listening to audiobooks is a great way to expand your knowledge in the time when you may be doing other things, such as driving or when you are at the gym. We have a special offer for you of a free audiobook of your choosing. To choose your free audiobook, go to www.freeaudiobookoffer.com. As long as you've not already signed up, then you will qualify. Lisa, it's now time to speculate about the future a little bit. What one thing would you do with your business if you knew that you could not fail? And this is a really interesting question for me, Um, because when I first thought about it, I thought, okay, well, I'm not really, you know, I'm not really looking to um, necessarily expand, you know, offices in different places and things like that. So I started to think about what are those things that I tried that have not worked in the past that I would want to work if I tried them again. And so it's definitely a place of where, what is it that I want um, that I'm so frustrated by that I can't make work. <laughs> that if I knew I couldn't fail, I'd be like, yes, I'm willing to put forth the effort and the um, energy a- into it. And it is um, investing in coaching to help build a solid, strategic <laughs> online funnel. Uh, one of my goals is to, as my as my coaching business progresses is to work with clients in the middle of the week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and not need to do a lot of the other in-person marketing activities I'm currently doing to build my business. And knowing that if I had a strong online, strong and strategic online presence, that would absolutely be the place. If I knew I couldn't fail doing that, I would invest my energy and time and money back into that effort. What skill, if you were excellent at it, would help you the most to double your business? Probably small talk Mm -hmm. (laughs) and making connections, meaningful connections with people uh, quicker. Um, Like I shared, you know, a networking meeting is my idea of absolute horrible, horrible things. Um, But knowing that people do business with people they like, know and trust, people need to get to know me. And the best way to do that is not to go in feeling so (laughs) uptight and are they looking at me? Will they talk to me? Like all that like middle school stuff. Um, So that's the place where when I can master that skill, I think that's definitely going to help my business. The thing is with network network meetings is that when you go there, there's always other people who are in exactly the same position as you, aren't you? That, that haven't got anyone else to talk to. They've not met anybody there. So there's always people that that you can easily connect with in any case. And it's probably one of those things that the more you do it, the better you get at it. Right. And, you know, and I, I know that I have come so far. So thank you for saying that because, yes, you know, and I have. And those are exactly the people that I look for. Mm-hmm. It's like, who's new here today? Who don't yeah. I know? Um, because I know that they may be feeling the same way that I am. And, you know, that's the place I go. But I just, you know, in general, like uh, being able to have that skill where my husband has it. My husband can walk into a room of 40 strangers and walk out with 40 friends. Wow. 
And I walk in a room with 40 strangers and think, holy crap, there's 40 strangers. Someone get me out of here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and he's all, how are you doing? How are the kids? You know? <laughs> so, yeah, it's a skill. <laughs> In five years from now, if a well-known business publication was publishing an article on your business after talking to your customers and suppliers, what would you like it to say? I would like the theme to be something along the lines of, she helped me see I could do it. Because that's what drives me, is being a part of someone's journey when they go from where they are to a place that they didn't even know they could get to. We are now at the part of the show where you share three golden nuggets with us. Lisa, what is your favorite quote and how have you applied it? My favorite quote, and I heard this first that I can remember in grad school, and it's, if nothing changes, nothing changes. And I love that quote. And I use that at the end of my presentations when we start to move into the, what are you going to do differently? places I use it to end my coaching sessions. I use that when I'm talking to prospective clients, you know, we get to the end and it's like, okay, well, if nothing changes, nothing changes. What are you going to do differently? It didn't expect, you know, for your life to be different in five years. Um, so that hands down is my favorite quote. Do you have any favorite online resources you can share with us that'd be useful for other entrepreneurs? I have a, um, a, a podcast um, that I really enjoy listening to, of course, in addition to yours, um, but he's also in the UK and his name's David Ralph and his podcast is Join Up Dots. Mm -hmm. And he is one of the people, his was the hardest, to, the hardest podcast ever to prepare for because he just said, we're going to talk about your life. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't know how to talk about my life. And he's like, you'll be fine. And I said, I don't think so. And I must have listened into prep for his podcast. I had to listen to like 30 episodes mm -hmm. of people talking about their life. <laughs> um, but the premise is that there are there are things that have happened in your life that when you look back now, you can see the progression of where you are now. And those are your dots. Mm -hmm. What is your best advice to other entrepreneurs? reach out, reach out for help. <laughs> when you're in that place, but I don't know what I don't know, get out and help some, have someone help you find what it is you don't know. When you get to a place where you know what you don't know, and it's time to up level your skill set, reach out for someone to help up level that. Find a mentor. You know, one of the great things for me is looking at Mary's business and thinking a couple years, I'm going to be right there because I'm on that path. Um, and, you know, she's happy and willing to share strategies. Folks, if you didn't manage to get a note of Lisa's favorite resource or her favorite books, you can find the links on Lisa's shows and the show notes page. Just go to the entrepreneurway.com and search for Lisa or Lisa Malice in the search box. Lisa, is there anything else that you'd like to add about your business? I feel like we've covered it all. Thank you. <laughs> Lisa, it really has been an honor having you on the show today. Thank you for coming on and talking about your transition and your journey from being a teacher to being a coach and also talking about your business of impact strategies and how you help other business owners get much more organized and get some of their lives back. You've shared some great perspective with us today. You've shared some of what you've learned. You've given us great advice and you really have given us some great value today. So thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for allowing me the opportunity to talk